On May 14, 2017, in this blooming season full of vitality, the Belt and Road International Summit Forum was held in the beautiful Yanqi Lake, Beijing, the capital of China. More than 1,500 representatives from over 17 international organizations and 130 more countries and five continents participated in this grand event and made their contributions. Shining with unprecedented energy, the age-old Silk Road, which was once a showcase, has traversed history, walking into people's heart and marching toward the future. The Belt and Road is escorted by laws, China ASEAN Legal Cooperation Center, CALCC. A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are live again. Today, we'll be discussing with uh, our good friend from the Philippines. Um, and uh, as you can see from the screen and uh, uh, let me do a, a introduction. Uh, on the right is uh, Ms. Go Xiangju, uh, a lawyer based in Kuala Lumpur. We have seen her in the past uh, episodes. Um, and and if, as you can see, the gentleman um, uh, on the screen is uh, Jay, um, Jay Patrick Santiago, right? So we call him Jay, and um, he's from the, uh, the Philippines. Uh, welcome to the, the uh, discussion today. Um, as usual, we'll uh, wait maybe for about one more minute uh, for more people to join us. For those who are just joining us, uh, please help us to share this, this um, live um, interview or live chat uh, with, with uh, as many people as you can, so that you know, more people will be able to uh, dis listen and learn from the, uh, this discussion today. Um, all right. So, um, Yes, hi. Uh, so there are already some, some uh, comments coming in. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Richard says, hi, Xiangju. And, and he say, hi, hi, Jay. Hello. Um, hi, hi. Hello. Hi, hi. So for those who just join us, um, feel free to uh, uh, type in your comments or even questions. Um, then uh, we'll try to take the questions um, uh, during this uh, discussion today. Uh, this morning, we had a discussion with um, a, a, a lawyer from Myanmar. And uh, now, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, in Kuala Lumpur time, we're having the, this discussion with our friend from the Philippines. And today is quite a busy day for us, even though it's a public holiday. Uh, later, at 6 o'clock, we'll be speaking to another friend from Singapore. So uh, it's almost uh, like... a a marathon. Um, Margaret says, uh, good afternoon, everybody, everyone. Hi, Margaret. Uh, Margaret has been following our show uh, as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Margaret, and uh, welcome again. Now, let us start. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, I, I'll uh, invite the, uh, the speakers to uh, introduce uh, themselves. Uh, um, we will start uh, ladies first, right? So we are like uh, Xiangju. Hi, Xiangju. Go ahead. Yeah, go Hello, ahead. Hello, hi everyone in KL and uh, uh, everywhere in the world. Uh, my name is Xiangju. I'm a practicing lawyer from uh, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And uh, my practice areas is uh, corporate and commercial uh, with emphasis in companies law and uh, real estate. I'm also the branding and marketing director of CLCC. Um, good to see everyone and happy Wizard Days. Happy holiday. All right, thank you, Xiangju. And I would like to invite Jay to say hello to the viewers online and also uh, to introduce herself to the, uh, the viewers. Jay. Hello, thank you. Thank you, Taeyong. Um, good afternoon to everyone. Um, whether you are from the Philippines or elsewhere, elsewhere in the world, you're from Malaysia, um, good afternoon to you. Um, I hope that you are all well um, during these very trying times. Um, I am Jay. Patrick Santiago. I am from the Philippines. I am a qualified lawyer in the Philippines and England and Wales. I am with Kisun Bing Torres, which is the Manila office of uh, Baker McKenzie. I'm doing primarily arbitration, uh, dispute resolution, as well as um, insolvency proceedings. All right, great. Uh, thank you for um, accepting our invitation to, to, um, to join this show. And uh, I would like to acknowledge um, our viewers, uh, Sandy Nian, uh, watching from Myanmar. 
Hello, hi, hi, Sandy. Um, I remember you uh, you joined us in a, a, the morning session with a, a lawyer from Myanmar as well. Uh, Sangju say hi, everyone. Um, I suppose Sangju is saying hi to the rest of the viewers. <laughs> and, uh, uh, rather than us, I say hello, Sangju. Uh, Chong, Chong Ting Fai is our friend from Singapore. And uh, yes, he say hello to everybody here. All right, so let's um, start. Uh, uh, the uh, discussion today. Now we look at the. Um, uh, th there are lots of um, uh, news that we hear uh, from from the Philippines at this moment. I've just checked. I, I always check before uh, speaking <laughs> to to everyone. Uh, it's about ten thousand confirmed cases, more than ten thousand, slightly more, and about uh, more than six hundred fifty cases uh, of uh, death uh, at this moment. And uh, we have also uh, hear a lot of the news um, outside the Philippines about the situation over there. Um, so I'd like to hear from Jay, uh, who is currently based in, in, in the Philippines. How's the situation over uh, in, in the Philippines right now? All right. Um, well, I, you've already read the news. Uh, the, 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 numbers of, uh, the number of COVID cases in the Philippines, as you said, is uh, more than 10,000 already it seems um, quite dire. Uh, at the moment, of course, there's a lot of clamor to, um, for PP, more PPEs, um, better healthcare services. Um, but at the same time, companies are you know, quite, in a way, struggling because uh, the, the, we're currently in a community quarantine. Um, some areas, beginning May 1st, are classified as under the enhanced community quarantine, which is a stricter form of community quarantine. The rest of the Philippines, um, they are under general community quarantine. For enhanced community quarantine, that is essentially a lockdown. So you're required to stay at home. If no one is allowed to go out unless you are um, accessing essential services or purchasing essential goods. That means going to the supermarket to buy food or going to a restaurant to buy takeaway food. Uh, so these, those are the things that you can do. Um, and as I mentioned earlier during before, before we get, went live, you cannot even walk your dog outside. Um, mm -hmm. So they're quite very strict on that. But at the same time, um, I guess the inverse of that is you know, what we can do. The inverse is the companies that can operate, the businesses that can operate, are only those that do provide essential services or essential goods. So these are supermarkets, restaurants. Other companies, other op um, businesses are not allowed to operate. Laundry, company, laundry shops are not even allowed. Barber shops are not allowed. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if you can notice from my haircut. <laughs> I haven't had a haircut for almost two oh, months now, so I apologize for that. have the same that. problem here as well. <laughs> same problem, same issue. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so that, that's uh, what's happening. One important exception to the, the operations of businesses in the Philippines, and I think this is because um, it does employ a lot of people in the Philippines, and the Philippines is quite well known in this kind of industry, is the BPO, the Business Process Outsourcing Companies. They do continue to, to operate, but there are still some challenges in that respect because as, an, as a consequence of enhanced community quarantine, public transportation is suspended. Mm -hmm. So um, it's quite a challenge for these companies that are allowed to operate during the ECQ to continue to operate if their employees cannot go to these to their establishments because there's no public transport. So the, right. they, these companies will have to provide transportation services to their employees. And because they cannot really accommodate everyone, they would have to operate on a skeletal workforce. Um, so these, these are some of the, the challenges right now that we are facing in the Philippines. Mm. Right. Uh, D, how strict is the community quarantine in over there? Because like in Malaysia, during our initial quarantine period, we, uh, we are not allowed to travel uh, more than one person in a car and each person has to have a, a, a mask on as well. And we can only go to uh, buy essential uh, products from in a radius of 10 kilometers in our residential areas. 
uh, how, how is it in uh, your uh, in Philippines? In the Philippines, they actually are quite strict. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier that you can go out to purchase um, essential goods. However, that's only limited to one member of your family. So right I now see. what they do is that they, the local governments will issue a quarantine pass. And you have to, you, so you have this physical pass that you have to bring at all times when you are outside. Oh, so and, every uh, household the way has to this the grocery. Pass. Every household yes, has Yes, they're this supposed pass. to. Oh, okay. Yes, they should, they should have that. Um, in fact, in some supermarkets, they will not even allow you to purchase anything there if you, don't, if you cannot show a quarantine pass. Uh, the, yeah, and they are also quite strict because the, these supermarkets are, are required to implement social distancing within their, inside their premises. Uh, yeah. So you will see long queues outside the supermarket because they cannot just allow everyone to come in. And in these long queues, it becomes longer because even in queues, you have to uh, apply social distancing. Yes. Yes. So it's quite stressful to really go to the supermarket. So when I go to the supermarket these days, I make sure uh, I buy stuff for the next two. That's a bit for the good for two weeks. I see. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. And then also, we, we, I, I mentioned to you um, earlier that they do check. Well, the police would actually check. And uh, the, I was walking, um, and I, I was with my dog. I, yeah. I thought I was allowed to walk my dog while I am uh, going to the supermarket, but apparently that's not allowed. Um, <laughs> even if, in truth and in fact, I actually went and I, 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 just, I just came from the supermarket. So they do actually stop you, ask you where you're going and where you are going, yeah. So are there right. any uh, punishment for breaching this quarantine, community quarantine order? What, what yes, the there is. In, in, in fact, there is a law. It's called the uh, Bayanihan We Heal as One Act. Um, that is the law that was enacted by Congress in the Philippines mm -hmm. to address the emergency, the public health emergency situation in the Philippines. There, it's actually a penal provision. Mm -hmm. um, you can go to jail for it and pay a fine if you, if you violate some of the prohibited acts under the law and one of the prohibited acts there is that you violate um, policies of I mean, the, the quarantine requirements or, or mandatory requirements under the quarantine period during the quarantine period mm. we, we, and we there have, have been some it. yeah and then there, there have been some although I, I, I must say that the uh, implementation is um, although quite strict they're quite lenient uh, because there are first-time offenders, so it's not like mm -hmm. it's, it's the first time you do it, you go you go to jail straight away. So they do right. they do take into account that it's a new law; not everyone might be aware of it. So the the local government officials in the Philippines, we call the barangay, are tasked to really monitor the implementation of this quarantine, and right. sometimes they would they would do some um, some form of punishment. To these, uh, to the people that they catch, these violators, hmm. that are not necessarily um, either a fine or imprisonment. Right. So there, have, there can be heard, like there, there be some news. Yeah. Yeah, we have heard about <laughs> news that um, uh, President Duterte um, uh, issued an order to shoot those uh, violators of the community quarantine. Um, I mean, I have also heard about, uh, the, I mean, the, 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 I mean, I also watched the video. So um, this order, how is it implemented and, uh, in, in the Philippines? I, I don't think that someone has been shot yet. Um, mm. I guess for someone who has mm. uh, seen him speak many, many times in the media, uh, mm. And for everyone, anyone who has the who has had the chance to really see mm. him speak, mm. Mm -hmm. you know that he has a certain tone as to how yeah. he says things, oh. and uh. he does not. It, that does not necessarily mean that you know if you violate the quarantine, then you get killed. Um, mm -hmm. The context of that statement is um, mm -hmm. with respect to this rally mm -hmm. that happened. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. there was a rally that was organized during the quarantine period. 
And obviously, that's a violation of the, the law at the moment. Um, and I understand from the news reports that the, the, the rally be, became quite violent. And he was, I think he was giving, he was saying that on the assumption that if the violators become violent and became a threat to the life and limb of the police officers, then mm -hmm. go ahead, do your, shoot mm. them if necessary. Mm, but mm -hmm. that's that's the context from right. where he was coming from. I see, I see. Because uh, from what you say, you see it's strict. But on the other hand, I think the the, the officers are quite lenient if you're a first time um, offender. Yes. So mm. uh, like, what what's happened but, to but, you? But you know, you 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 cannot really uh, even even if there are instances where you think they would be lenient. Um, I don't think it's. Uh, it's, I think I don't think that's enough for you to not comply with the law yeah. because yeah. you'll never find out if you if this policeman who catches you is you know applies things strictly on right. you. So you, you might want you have to follow the law. Right. Yeah. So um, when we say the enhanced um, community quarantine, um, you are still able to do the shopping of uh, groceries all right okay in in malaysia yes. we, we we have the the movement control order the mco and we also have the uh, enhanced uh, mco the emco whereby the uh, the whole area is cordoned off with the barbed wires so wow. there's no in there's no out <laughs> yes Ooh. with the military <laughs> holding guns and uh, so oh. uh, the outsiders would deliver interesting food in. Yeah, so so the the version is uh, uh, actually slightly different. that actually that has happened um, in some uh, instances right. here in the Philippines. There is no um, there there are no barbed wires. I don't think they have the budget for that. But uh, <laughs> but I think there was a time uh, before this uh, enhanced community quarantine happened. You know, before this all happened, there was a, a declaration of public health emergency, and right. there was a, a community quarantine at that time before all of this formal declaration of enhanced community quarantine. So at that time, there were some, some small areas within Metro Manila where oh. there were cases. And at that time, they were still trying to contain that, mm. uh, the, the cases at that time. So they would cordon off a specific area right. in the, yes. within the city to make sure that no one comes in and out. Yes, um, yes, but yes. now, because of the enhanced community quarantine, everyone is not allowed to go out unless right. you're accessing essential goods and service or services. Yeah, yes. and uh, we, here we have uh, evolved to the new term called conditional, conditional um, uh, movement control yes. order. So uh, that's the the uh, uh, on the first uh, the fourth of May, which is Monday this week. Um, most of the sectors. Uh, in Malaysia, uh, we are able to start a uh, business and operate, um, but with the condition that you have to comply with lots of uh, SOP, the standing operate uh, standard operating procedures. Mm. Um, uh, but there's there is a situation uh, uh, that happened where the the uh, federal government says that you know we are under this conditional MCO, more relaxed, you can start work. But certain states in Malaysia. Uh, certain states in Malaysia say no. We are going to continue the normal, the MCO. So that looks like as though that that's the difference between the federal and the state. Um, I would like to seek your view. Um, in the Philippines, that does this happen uh, in the national level and also the mayor of the each cities? Is there a, a different types of um, community quarantine policies? In the Philippines, we have. Um, I think this issue is relevant um, only because. Last May 1st, there was a transition of certain areas in the Philippines from ECQ, which is the Enhanced Community Quarantine, to GCQ. So GCQ is a more lenient form of community quarantine. So th during that time, there were a number of provinces that actually, or areas in the Philippines, that uh, wrote a letter to this task force that is in tasked to supervise the situation in the Philippines. Um, they, they wrote a letter to this to this task force and asked and they asked them if they can continue to to do the ECQ in their in their locality and I understand um, based on recent news that none of those were allowed none of those were granted so um, but that doesn't stop 
the local governments to write a letter in the future in case the situation changes. So they would do it on a case-by-case basis. And right. uh, with respect to your question, if these provinces or cities can just go ahead even without the government's um, approval, you know, they said you're GCQ, but they said we will proceed with ECQ. I don't care what the government says. Then they're going to go. They're going to be in trouble because that's a violation of the Bayanihan law that I mentioned earlier. Mm. Okay. Bayanihan law. Uh, what What does it mean uh, in in English? Right. Okay. Well, <laughs> it's a uh, the, the 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 name of the law is. Um, let me just look at the exact term, um, which Republic Act that is. Um, mm-hmm. But let me see. Um, right. Just give me a second. The exact name sure, sure. of the law is Republic Act 11469. And the, the short term for it is the Bayanihan to Heal as One Act. Bayanihan is a term mm. in, in the Philippines, which means you help each other. Uh, right. so we help each other to heal as one. So as a country, we heal from this uh, COVID situation. Right. I heard that this okay. act actually uh, gives the president ex- very, very wide power in this pandemic. Right. That, that's, that's correct. Um, although even before this law, there is another law that allows the president to declare a state of public health emergency. And okay. once, that yes. is, once that is declared, the government, the, the, the president would have a wide range of powers. So I think what this law did is to just formalize and enhance the law um, or enhance the, the powers of the president during this crisis. It does yeah. include a lot of um, powers that the president can can do, um, but at the same time, it also provides for other um, provisions relating to subsidies, relating to um, provision of essential goods and services. Mm-hmm. Um, and as I said, there's a penal provision to ensure that these policies are complied with. Okay, uh, Jay, uh, it right. has been uh, it has been two months since. Bayan also- yeah, Bayan <laughs> is a nation in the Philippines. In the Philippines, if you just yes. say Bayan, ah, it's nation. Okay. Bayan also means Hi, nation. Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> right, Xiangzhu, you you were saying something? Yeah, yeah. Um, it has been two months since the uh, community quarantine uh, is ordered. Um, do you think that uh, at the mo- is the new cases is a case in uh, COVID nineteen cases in Philippines? Is it contained already? Do you think, or is it still hiking, or is it? Because I read on the news that uh, that, that was a uh, end of April, uh, like you have one thousand one hundred health workers uh, tested positive for uh, COVID nineteen, and among them you have uh, about twenty doctors who died from this COVID nineteen as well. Is it because of a uh, lack of adequate uh, protective gear, or do you have shortages? Uh, that's very serious shortages. Um, um, that's when a very political, politically <laughs> typical <laughs> question. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. But, but, okay. Well, I, what I can say, what I can say here is um, whether we are spiking, whether we are flattening the curve, I think there's, um, there's a lack of information as regards I, that. Okay. Only because um, I think there is still not a wide, I mean, I think, I think the public testing or the testing among you know everyone testing mm. everyone is still not widespread in the yeah. Philippines. Okay. Mm. All right. I don't think they have sufficient kits to really test everyone, so they okay. cannot really assess yet at the moment the exact I gravity see. of the situation in the Philippines. Mm. Right. I see. Okay. Uh, and I also understand that Philippines is one of the largest exporters of medical workers in the world. So uh, yeah. there have been order to uh to uh, not to let these medical workers uh, go out right there there was and that was very very controversial that was very controversial um i just can't recall now if um they've changed their mind as regards that policy i I do recall that there was an outrage um from that because of course you're depriving people of their means of uh, living Um, they already have their contracts they're they're supposed to fly out already to work 
um, but then the government stops them. Um, I think there was uh, something was already done about it, but I'm not, just not sure, sure the, about the latest. Okay. All right. Right. So for the, uh, the businesses um, under um, uh, this community quarantine, uh, CQ, uh, where they are not able to operate, um, how's the, what's the legal position, you know, whether the employers uh, should continue to pay the salary or wages of the uh, employees? Okay, that's um, in terms mm. of labor. Yeah. I just, I just have to give a disclaimer that I'm not a labor lawyer, okay? Sure. But, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. but from the different issuances of the Department of Labor regarding this, they do encourage the, the employers to provide you know, other flexible work arrangements. Um, they also um, suggest that maybe first apply forced leaves, um, that individual individual employees can use up their leaves leaves first rather than um, doing a retrenchment or a layoff um, of their employees. So that is um, currently what's happening. They also suggest um, rotation of workers, telecommuting, work from home. And, and I think for some companies that's working, um, but you know, not, of course, not everyone would have the resources to work from home and not all businesses are, are I think compatible with work from home arrangements. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Um, so for those who are working from home, um, uh, uh, are the companies allowed to do a, like, for example, pay cut? Um, well, that is, I think, mm. um, that's mm. part of uh, you know the, the mm. suggestion of yeah. the of the Department of Labor. So instead of retrenching, you can. Talk to your employees and mm -hmm, make them mm -hmm. agree that right, the, you right. pay them a, a pay cut. Uh, because Philippine laws on labor are quite strict. So in uh, under the law, you know, there's there's this such thing as no dem diminution of benefit. You know, so mm. you cannot really give them a lower amount just because these things happen. Um, so what is suggested is you have to talk to your employees, discuss mm. with them the situation, and come up with a mutual agreement as to how the the salary can be dealt with uh, right oops um it's okay we are bringing him in okay sorry hi jay i, I thought you were lost okay we're yeah. back so yeah, but, right. but that uh, there's that wouldn't stop i think companies to do a retrench, retrenchment if necessary in the future um, mm. Because let's face it, this COVID-19 really took a toll on the businesses. And in fact, we are mm. even foreseeing the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. So, so definitely yeah. uh, retrench retrenchment can be inevitable in certain industries. And to do that, there are also um, a number of requirements under Philippine law to be able to validly do that. There should be... Um, it should be because you want to prevent losses. You can't just stop because it, it was you were given the opportunity because it's COVID. You have to be you have to prevent substantial losses. Um, there should be a right. notice to the employees and the Department of Labor. You have to pay separation pay. Um, the criteria for choosing in the, the the employees who will be part of the retrenchment. The, the criteria should be fair and reasonable, and you should do this in good faith. Okay. Yes. Did, uh, uh, yes. Did, I, I, I think it. Yeah. Did the Philippines Sorry, you government you provide? Yeah, did the Philippines government provide any subsidies, uh, to the companies or businesses, uh, for these wages to subsidize the wages? Okay, for for subsidy of wages, I'm not aware of. But what the what the government is doing to help the businesses is that the they required, um, the payment of. Uh, commercial lease of these businesses to be suspended. Mm. So okay. during the what they what they required is if the rent is due during the ECQ period, then from the last payment date supposedly during the ECQ period, you have thirty days um, with, within which um, you know, you're, you're not supposed to pay the the rent. And then whatever was accumulated during the ECQ period. You can pay that within the next six months after the ECQ 
was lifted. Oh. So there, there are ways, there are things right. they are doing um, to alleviate the situation. Uh, for, the, for the workers, the government is providing subsidy for the, for the poorest of the poor. Um, they yeah. do provide quite minimal subsidy, but still, it's better than nothing. So they, they are doing that. Also, um, the rent, they've also asked uh, public utilities to suspend the, the, the bills. They should, the statement of accounts of these public utilities can be suspended. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they do try to do their best. But in so far as budget is concerned as to whether they would subsidize the, the employee salaries, I'm not sure and probably not. Mm. 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 This uh, this uh, delay of the rental uh, until thirty days after the ECQ is, is it a pursuant to a specific law or um, uh, uh, by by the uh, federal at the federal level? Is if it I'm the not same mistaken, applies to all? I, yes, I think it, it's mm. under the Bayanihan law. If I'm not mistaken, mm. right? Wow. Okay. How about the subsidies for the poor? Is there any, uh, what is the government's uh, arrangement for the poor? Uh, any subsidies of, or food distribution, things like yes. that? Um, the, the subsidy is also provided by the Bayanian law. Uh, mm. there, the, the, there are some relief goods being given out, but that is primarily being done by the local governments. So the nice. mayors mm. uh, that has jurisdiction over their cities and you know, locations, they are primarily in charge in doing that. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So for those who are watching us live now, um, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to drop that the comment column. Um, we may not be able to answer all your questions, but we will try to uh, with the um, uh, with our uh, this uh, opinion or, or views of uh, of the speakers. Now, uh, the le next question I'd like to ask uh, Jay is about the future, the future of the legal profession. Um, with this um, COVID nineteen pandemic coming in, do you foresee see that the lawyer's life will be more challenging in the future um, because we have spoken to many countries, um, I mean lawyers for, from different countries. Some expect that uh, there will be more cases after this uh, COVID-19, perhaps due to the disputes in terms of a contract um, and a commercial and also even from family law. Uh, I think the divorce cases is uh, expected to be uh, on the rise. Uh, but some say that uh, those transaction-based um, business, for example, property will be, uh, for, or, or, or corporate um, transactions will be lesser. So uh, how do you see this, um, the future of the legal profession? Um, currently, I, do, I can say that law firms in the Philippines do have their, their um, austerity measures at the moment. So some law firms have, um, uh, I think, deducted some salary from their employees. Um, some have required them to go on forced leave. Um, some have required them to just go to the office for three days instead of five days. So th the law firms have been affected by mm -hmm. this financial crisis, by like the COVID-19 crisis and uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure the ensuing financial crisis. So th that is currently being felt by the legal industry in the Philippines. And plus the fact that you know, courts are closed in the Philippines. So litigators who usually earn based on their appearance fees and mm -hmm. um, drafting of pleadings are not earning at the moment. So they are really mm -hmm. affected by this situation. Um, what I can say is that in probably in the future, what this is doing to the legal industry in the Philippines is that it's pushing the, I think, the digitalization of, of, of lawyering in the Philippines. And, and I only say that because uh, recently the Supreme Court, which, which regulates the practice of law in the Philippines, has issued a number of um, issuances relating to online hearings. Mm -hmm. um, but that only includes... But, uh, but that only covers, at the moment, um, criminal cases or, or cases involving persons who are deprived of their liberty, so those who are currently in jail. 
Uh, so I think that's a good start uh, okay. because mm -hmm. I think for the longest time, I think the court system has been quite antiquated. Um, in fact, we have only recently amended our rules. It, it actually became effective just last May 1st, the rules on civil procedure. And mm. thankfully this time, the court allows the filing service of um, pleadings and other submissions by email. So that's mm -hmm. finally, you, finally, we can submit pleadings by email in the trial court level. So that's, that's um, the timing I think is good because, not, because especially mm -hmm. now people don't want to go to court to really file something. You can already okay. just um, do, do that online, of course, with the court's permission. Because there's, mm -hmm. there are instances when the court might not want to, to allow online filing. Mm -hmm. uh, but at least that's what's pushing the legal industry right now to go with the digitalization of the practice. Another example I can think of is uh, on the training of lawyers. Recently, the Mandatory Legal Education Committee has allowed the, the has allowed an online platform to provide um, legal training because we're, we're required to have mandatory units, 36 units in three years. So, so before, there were no rules whether you can do it online. Now, you can do it online. Recently, there was a seminar that I attended. We talked about the revised rules. And for the first time, they did it online. So that's, that's actually very good. So that's what it's doing in the actual practice. Now, with respect to the types of cases in the future, definitely we will be seeing issues relating to breaches of contract because of force majeure, um, yeah. uh, impossibility to act, or the parties did not contemplate this situation. And under Philippine law, there are about three grounds that you can invoke that mm -hmm. I can think of that can mm -hmm. relate to the difficulties brought about by COVID-19. In addition mm -hmm. to that, I think there could be some issues on restructuring uh, in commercial transactions. And that's what we are already seeing in our firm. We do get a, um, a number of inquiries about restructuring. And when I say restructuring, mm. the, the mode of restructuring is quite broad. So there's one where all they need to do is renegotiate all of their contracts. There's another mm. one that all they want us to do is review all their contracts and think about ways for, the, for them to terminate some of the non-essential contracts that they have. Or there are some inquiries on what they can do because uh, an important... A supplier in their supply chain is experience is experiencing financial difficulty whether they would just um, lend this person loan a an amount of money do they need to bail this out do they need to just um, absorb this company in a mergers and acquisition transaction mm. so these are some of they're, they're basically looking for ways to lower their costs at the moment mm. so that's the type of restructure they're looking at um, do they think they need um, this much physical space now that they know that they can actually work offline, you know, so that would lower their rental fees, you know, the rent that they pay every month. So that's the restructured bit. The other bit is mm -hmm. if you're not, if you're unable to restructure, you're going to be bankrupt. You're going to be insolvent. So there mm -hmm. could be cases on insolvency in the future, especially after this when courts are open. Um, and there have been, we have had some inquiries regarding that as well, uh, whether it's better to just um, file an insolvency case rather than be liable for future debts that they think they couldn't pay anymore. And as regards the, mm. the group of companies as a whole, whether it's okay to just have this member of their group of companies um, go down the drain because mm. it's, gonna just, it's just mm. going to pull down the entire group. So, you know, these are some mm. of the cases um, that I foresee that um, will be in our courts um, in the future. Mm. Mm -hmm. Is there a general um, uh, interpretation whether this COVID-19 uh, is a, a force major event or it, okay. it depends on how is it drafted in, in a contract? Um, Interestingly, um, the, the law, sorry, under Philippine law, force majeure is actually provided in our civil code. 
So it's not like English law mm. where you only have the doctrine of mm. frustration. It's not written. In the Philippines, we have it in the civil code. So we do have very specific requirements before this provision can apply to, a, to your situation. Mm. Um, how unfortunately, whenever I think about this force majeure and I connect it to COVID-19, the more I think that it's not really the COVID-19 situation that is the force majeure, it is actually the ensuing governmental acts that is the force majeure that was unforeseen. So mm. it's really the governmental yeah. acts. Mm. Because it's the governmental acts that tells you to stop operating. It's the governmental mm. acts that tells you um, you cannot um, do this or that. Public, transportations, tra public transportation is suspended and so the company cannot operate. So it's really the governmental acts that is the proximate cause of the mm. inability to comply with mm. an obligation. Mm. Yes. So that's, um, that's quite interesting. But um, also at the same time, if, if you look at jurisprudence in the Philippines, how the courts have interpreted um, uh, this a similar situation, because currently there's no Supreme Court ruling. In the Philippines, juris, there's, we have jurisprudence, but what mm. you can cite in cases is only Supreme Court decisions, not the Court of Appeals or the court, trial court decisions. You can cite them, but they are just there to, to convince the court but it's not binding. So it's only Supreme Court decisions that are binding. So currently, there's no Supreme Court decision that really deals with a pandemic um, mm. at the moment. So I'm not sure how courts will do this. There have been some mm. cases before that spoke about um, financial crisis. Like during the 2008 financial crisis, um, there was one Supreme Court right. case that uh, dealt with it. And there's also one in the 1980s um, brought about by, if you recall, there was um, a people power revolution in the Philippines. And, mm. after, and mm. after the people power revolution, there was um, some financial difficulties for some companies and the economy was down um, because of all the troubles back then. So mm. there, were, there were grounds raised to the Supreme Court saying that they cannot comply with their obligations because of the financial crisis. And these Supreme Court decisions said, based on these Supreme Court decisions, the financial crisis is not a fortuitous event. So it's, it's right. actually quite difficult. So if, if eventually mm -hmm. there's a financial crisis coming out, coming out of this COVID-19 situation, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not very certain in that the Supreme Court would be that open in interpreting mm -hmm. the financial crisis as a form of um, fortuitous event or force majeure for purposes of non-compliance mm -hmm. with obligations. Right. I think in Malaysia, we, we haven't thought of force major from that aspect. We, in Malaysia, we, we are always arguing about uh, whether the pandemic is considered an, a force major event and how it's drafted in the clause, right? Yes. Because in, in Malaysia, we do, we, um, this force major is not stated in the civil code that what uh, we, uh, you have it in the Philippines. So it all depends on what is drafted in the agreement. If the agreement says um, in the event of um, a pandemic, epidemic, government administrative order, or you say government act, so, so long as you spell out inside, then the yeah. lawyers will quickly pick up the, the document and say, hey, no force major. So that's the, the uh, position uh, yeah. uh, we have right, it here. Right. So, uh, right. and you, in, you're in right. Uh, you don't even have to put it in the contract. You don't have to put it in the contract because ah. the law expressly allows it. Oh, right. Okay. So here, here in Malaysia, we, we have to uh, uh, put in a contract specifically. Otherwise, you are not um, able to uh, rely on this, uh, the concept of uh, force majeure. Of course, there is another one is called the doctrine of impos uh, frustration. Doctrine of frustration. 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 Mm -hmm. So yeah, but the, the level is um, slightly higher um, because it, it has to be impossible to perform. So, um, but of course, you look at the financial crisis. Is it impossible to, perf to perform or is it more expensive to perform? So that you've got to <laughs> yes. distinguish that. Yes. A, <laughs> so so all, all the delay and all these legal questions will come into play. Uh, and you're mm -hmm. right. I think um, for the corporate world, a lot of clients will contact the lawyers to actually review the contracts um, and see uh, is there any way out um, 
uh, by you know looking all these clauses. Um, mm. Now I just want to uh, uh, ask you about this uh, the digitization uh, among lawyers. Uh, um, uh, you know, it seems to be the uh, common trend after speaking to many lawyers, and this is the only way uh, moving forward. Uh, the dinosaur and the traditional way of uh, practicing, I think, somehow uh, we really have to move on and uh, to adapt this new way of lawyering, as you uh, as you say. Now, uh, in Philippines, um, uh, it's a uh, video conferencing among clients and uh, among um, uh, lawyers. Is it something common prior to this uh, COVID-19 or everybody started to do this now? Um, I think in general, hello, can you hear me? Mm. Yes, yes, I okay. can hear you. Yes, yeah. yes, I think in, in our firm, um, teleconferencing, uh, we do have video conferencing facilities in our offices. Um, that they're, they're not quite common, but we're familiar with it because clients yes. mm -hmm. elsewhere would, would request it and we do need the facility we do have the facilities for that um mm. but in general i think in the philippines no uh, there the i've known lawyers um right now that cannot even operate an ipad <laughs> it's the first time they are using zoom okay. using you know these kinds mm. of technology so it's uh it would take a while for them to really adjust to to, to the new mm. normal as they say mm. Yes, yes. So what's your view about that, Sangju? The new normal digitization of uh, legal industry? I guess that's something that uh, we have no choice, but we have to learn and have to manage. So, and also at the same time, invest uh, uh, in, in some software and training to come up with this digi uh, digitalization. So, yeah. And in, in my mm, practice, right. um, it has not been quite um, an issue because I do arbitration. And in, in arbitration, video conferencing is quite uh, normal. Um, video calls yeah. are quite normal and everything can be sent by email. So it's very seamless. But um, for the practitioner in court, for the court practitioner, it's quite difficult because they are quite restricted to physical service, registered mail, Oh. and they're not sure. quite used to emails right so um the other question i have is about this um uh any i mean you mentioned about this bayan uh, nihan is it uh the uh, is there any other act or bayan nihan is so so wide that you know gives all the powers to deal with this COVID 19. um um yeah so what Jay. what happens is um we do have the bayan act that so that's the law but um, in addition yeah. to the president, the, the P, there is a task force. It's called the uh, IATF. Let me see the. It's called the. Uh, um, what does it mean? It's called the IATF. It's it's the task force that that is tasked to monitor the situation as well as issue some um, recommendations for the uh, for the president. So they provide mm. us with the omnibus guidelines recently as to which mm. areas would be um, under ECQ, which areas would be under GCQ, what they mm -hmm. can and cannot do under certain situations and which depending mm -hmm. on which industry. So they would issue this um, recommendations. And then what will happen is the day after or maybe the evening, the same day the, ish the guidelines are issued, the president will adopt mm. that. Right, and so um, it's really the the IATF guidelines that people are really focusing on and what they say. Because usually, what the guidelines say, what the IATF says, the president would usually just say yes to it. Right. Um, right. But in addition, but in addition to all of these issuances by the IATF and the uh, approval of the president, there are also um, there are requirements for various um, agencies to issue implementing guidelines. For, for instance, mm -hmm. there was the, the omnibus guidelines and they say other manufacturing companies um, can only uh, operate under GCQ. So it's not clear what are these other manufacturing companies. So the next day, I think two days later, the Department of Trade and Industry issued a memorandum circular clarifying that statement. 
So mm -hmm. that actually gave me a lot of headache, <laughs> um, a huge headache, because <laughs> there, there seemed to be some incompatibility between what is provided in the guidelines as between, and, and as also what the DTI actually issued. Um, but yeah, you have to grapple with all of these nuances from the national government, from the IATF, from the president, from the, from the regulating agencies, from the local right. government units, meaning the mayors, the governors. Well, they're, all, they're, they're, all intended to, um, they're all intended to be harmonized together, but there are some, mm -hmm. some aspects that sometimes they can be ambiguous or still make them inconsistent with each other. Mm. Right. Okay. I, I just checked. Um, IATA stands for Interagency Task Force. <laughs> yes, but, uh, there, there's still okay. something after that? that. There's another one, oh, slash this, something. Slash this something. This is the slash something. Ah, oh, yeah. Interagency Task Force on Emerging Infectious Diseases. So it's the uh, IATF EID. Infectious Diseases. Uh, EID, yes, yes, yes. Yes, it's emerging infectious diseases. Yeah, I think the task force will harm, try tries to harmonize the uh, the uh, regulations. Sometimes uh, mm -hmm. we, we 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 see it here as well. Sometimes this department uh, will will announce certain rule. Department will come up something that is uh, kind of uh, conflicting as well. So yeah, all right. So um, I think. Uh, uh, Originally, we say, uh, I think uh, Sanju informed me that, you know, uh, that the discussion is about half an hour, but we are way past <laughs> 30, 30 minutes. But this is, this is usually what happened because it's quite interactive and people ask questions. And um, uh, so we like to ask more um, from, from uh, you. Now, um, Jay, I liked, um, yeah. What, what is your experience uh, uh, by working from home? Uh, what, what do you think? Is, is this uh, prior to this, uh, are you... Uh, do you have flexible working hours or have you been working from home a lot or is just mm -hmm. through you know this well in interestingly um as a matter of uh, law or policy the government quite um you know before the the pandemic happened issued um i think that's a law that allowed flexible working arrangements um and the reason for Issue that is because law. traffic Yes, uh, on, on flexible working oh. arrangements. And that is because of the traffic in Metro Manila. So people were complaining about the traffic. And so they were saying, why can't we just work from home? We need, we need this, blah, 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 blah. And so the government responded by saying, okay, fine. The employers are encouraged to, require, to allow um, employees to do flexible work arrangements. And then the COVID-19 happened. And now uh, I think it's perfect timing, even if in a very unfortunate event. Um, but in my firm, we've been doing flexible work arrangement for a long, long time. So mm. if you are, um, I think, a, a more senior junior lawyer or a senior lawyer and a partner, you can have one or two days per week uh, work from home arrangement. So um, I've been quite used to it even before, mm. but I, I still used to prefer working in the office because it's much more interactive. Um, you have everything you need there. Um, yeah. You're not crammed in your dining table. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, had had I known, had yeah. I known, I would have bought a, a, a very beautiful office desk <laughs> <laughs> and a very ergonomic uh, office chair uh, here at home. Because right now I'm sitting on yeah. my dining table, uh, on my regular chair, and my yeah. desk is my dining table. <laughs> yeah, okay. Right. All right. Okay, so uh, uh, I would like to invite Xiangju to uh, um, make a concluding remarks about the discussion today. Well, uh, first of all, I'm very happy to see you again, Jay, and good to know that you're doing well. I've been very busy, although this uh, is under this uh, <laughs> CQ. Well, I think uh, digitalization, like you say, it, it's, uh, it's something that we have to adopt to whether or not we are prepared going forward. And um, well, I just hope that the situation in, in Malaysia, I, I think, and finger crossed, I think the situation is getting better. The numbers are looking okay lately. And I hope that the, in the Philippines, uh, it will become better very, very soon. Yeah. All right, thank you. And I would like to invite Jay to uh, uh, make a concluding remarks about uh, our discussion today.
Right. Um, well, thank you, Xiangju, for inviting me here, um, Taeyong. It's a pleasure yeah. to spend the afternoon with you. Um, always a good, always good to discuss these things with you, and always good to talk to another person while I'm in quarantine. So, <laughs> this is very, very welcome. <laughs> well, I, I think right. the, the the Philippines, I think, has a, a good set of laws in place to deal with the situation. Um, it's all just a matter of implementing it seamlessly and mm. for you know, people's, the, the cooperation of the population of the people to really um, make sure that we triumph over this, uh, this situation. But mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that we will uh, come out of this as uh, a better people, more advanced, I, th I hope so, um, more um, aware about the, how to um, deal with situations like this. We learn from this so that in the future we can deal with this in a better manner. Mm. That's all. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Have you considered you. to keep your hair long? To take <laughs> you, you don't you don't have a barber open for you now. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Is your Sorry Shihua for going to make an appearance? Right. Is right. going to make an appearance? Where's your chihuahua? Oh, oh yeah, my chihuahua. Um, yeah. I think he's still he's sleeping. He's doing an sleeping? afternoon nap. All right. <laughs> Next time then. Okay. Next time. <laughs> okay. Sure. Uh, again, thank you, Xiangju, for joining us today. And uh, thank you okay. so much, Jay, for spending this evening. Um, uh, yes, I think uh, the purpose of having uh, this, this this discussion uh, organized by the China ASEAN Legal Cooperation Center (CALCC) is to uh, catch up with our friends, um, people whom we have met before, um, the lawyers, the legal practitioners around the world. Where we ask, first of all, say hello to the everybody, say how everybody's doing, and also to to understand the uh, the the landscape, the the regional landscape in each of the country. And I think. To, this session is about, I think, 17 or 18 episodes. So we have been doing this many, wow. many times. So we have a few more to, to go. And I, I find it it's, it's, a, it's a quite um, uh, uh, useful and to, you, to hear from um, you, all of you, the, the speakers, and to also explain to us uh, the situation on the ground. So thank you so much. Uh, for those viewers who are still online now, thank you so much. Um, um, uh, we are so glad that you know this this uh, series we have uh, good followers and followers uh, watching us live as well as uh, watching the video later so this will be um, a video that uh, we we have it on our facebook and also on our, on, on our youtube in the future so you know years later we'll think about the COVID-19 law series and there are lots of material here all right so uh, I hope and I wish everybody uh, to stay healthy and uh, uh, more importantly, to stay positive. Uh, I think uh, looking at Jay and Xiangju now, I think both of them are very positive. And um, despite this COVID-19 pandemic, um, mm -hmm. I think uh, the legal profession mm -hmm. got to change and uh, to adapt to the new changes. Uh, my name is Teta Yong and uh, we are signing off uh, for today's session. And thank you for the viewers who are still uh, watching us right now. All right. Okay. Yeah, take yeah, care. Bye -bye. Bye. Bye, bye. 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 Okay.